1984 was not about authoritarianism on its own. A lot of people mistake that. There, there are a lot of like, what you see in the book covers for 1984 is often very indicative of how well well a company was able to capture the spirit, you know? Like, what was 1984 about? So, so on a very surface level, who, okay, who here has read 1984? Who here has read 1984? Come on. Yeah, most. It's a very good book. Yeah, I know it's required reading, but it's a very, very, very good book. There are some, um, there are some passages in that book I remember very vividly. And, you know, I'm, I'm looking at all the book covers because there are a million, a million versions. Most book covers for 1984 have a human eye or eyes uh, as their as their main look. There, 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 you know, there's a lot to it. Like you have. What do you have here? You know, I, 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 here's an eye in a television screen, big old eye with like radiant shit coming out of it. Uh, here's the back of a neck. I think that's interesting. Got a loudspeaker, eyes, eye. Like, there's a lot of stuff, you know? Usually when people talk about 1984, they talk about two things. Surveillance and authoritarianism. And those are like the two big things. But those are actually very surface level elements of 1984. I've read that book a lot because I think that book is very politically informative. And what 1984 is about, more than anything else, is about psychology. It's about psychology and the power of controlling other people's psychology. See, we've lived in authoritarian, I'm sorry, humans have lived in authoritarian governments before, you know, or totalitarian. A Nazi Germany was a totalitarian government. Stalin's uh, Soviet Union was totalitarian. These, 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 these countries were unique in that they, they didn't limit their operation to merely controlling the faculties of the state. It was necessary to control the mind state of the people who lived in there. See, that's the big difference. A, a, a monarchy can be authoritarian. You can have a monarchy where the peasantry is treated cruelly, the merchant class is taxed massively, the aristocracy is kept in line, all under a single divine god king. And you can have such a society. But that type of authoritarianism is very different from the, the subtle ways that say, for example, Nazi Germany mandated not only the behavior, but the mind state of the people who lived within it, because you have things like secret police, the secret police, they could be your neighbor, they could be your supervisor at work, they could be your, your mailman, anyone, and you have to be very careful at all times about what you say, and who you say it to, and how you say it, because if you say something wrong, even in the comfort of your own home, that could be it for you. They, they encourage children to rat on their parents. This is one of the, um, the great paranoias of the book 1984. It's not just about authoritarianism. If you actually read the fucking text, and nobody has read, nobody's read 1984, but if you actually read it and go back and look at the tense moments, how much tension in 1984 comes from the police, how much of it comes from the state, or how much of it comes from saying or thinking the wrong thing in the wrong place at the wrong time. Almost all of the tension is a war between his thoughts and his outward appearance. That right there is the terror that he experiences. That at all times he harbors seditious thoughts in his head and at any, anything could give him away. He could, in his sleep, he could speak something that would get him in trouble because the telescreen, in, that's what it's called, right? The telescreen? Um, the telescreen in his home could record him in his sleep. He has to make sure that when he falls asleep, he doesn't think seditious thoughts because if he does, he might speak them in his sleep. In fact, one of his coworkers gets arrested for just such a reason. He has to make sure to moderate his expression when he's speaking to other people to make sure that when somebody else says something about the government or about politics, that he doesn't reveal too much with his language or with how he, uh, you know, with how he reacts. He does, he says the right or the wrong things. The whole, the book isn't about surveillance explicitly because surveillance is empirical. Surveillance is technological. Surveillance is understandable. Surveillance is a camera. Surveillance is a bug. It's a wire. Surveillance has a material presence. The real terror is thought, and it is thought that the book is about. 
not just the thought of Winston, the protagonist of the book, but the thoughts of everybody else as well. Great detail, great emphasis is placed in the thoughts that Winston ex believes are in the minds of other people. What he thinks of his, his beau, what he thinks of uh, uh, his co-workers. He thinks, how well do these other people withstand the scrutiny of the state? How well do they manage themselves? There's a, early on in the book, there's a, there's a part, he reflects upon the fact that he is one co-worker, a very intelligent man, who is rapturously devoted to Ingsoc, the political philosophy of the society that he lives in. And he can explain in great detail why it's important and compelling and it's necessary and it liberates the soul and so on. And Winston is thinking, he's thinking to himself the entire time, this man is going to die. He's too intelligent. He understands why we do the things we do too well, and he speaks of it too. It doesn't matter that he's a party loyalist. It doesn't matter that he would never raise a hand against the government. He is going to die. And additionally, there was another coworker who does something that he describes as duck speak, which is a term in the new speak, uh, which is to prattle endlessly without thought. You may have seen some political commentators engage in this. I think, I think Steven Crowder is probably the most effective advocate of this particular type of speech, where you prattle on and on, you loudly and aggressively and exuberantly express some belief or thought, and you, you don't think, you just say. You don't think, you just say. Have you seen people online who talk like that? It's just all buzzwords and virtue signaling, and you know that if you asked any clarifying questions, they would stop and look at you, like, like with offense, like, like you've wronged them in some way. The more, the more you go on in the book, the more psychological it becomes, and the head games that Winston plays with himself and with the other people around him and eventually with the state. The last third of the book, spoilers, after he's captured, is essentially a prolonged interrogation scene between him and his former boss, a person who actually works for uh, essentially the secret police, the person who breaks him. And the climax of the book... Muted? How am I muted? I don't know. The climax of the book is Winston coming to accept the society that he lives in. That's the climax of the story. It's about breaking him and um, reworking his brain and getting him with the proper stimulus of fear and, you know, political um, hind thought and, and a double think which is something that I've talked about in this channel many times before. The ability to simultaneously believe two separate things. Matt Gates, fascist in Congress, supports the attack on the Capitol, but also claims it was Antifa who did it. I guarantee you he believes both of those things. He knows he's lying when he says it was Antifa, but he believes both things anyway. I guarantee you. How many people have you argued with online where they say something erroneous, fallacious, you know it's not true, but they say it confidently and you challenge them on it and they actually defend it and you get the impression that they don't actually know whether or not they believe it either. Because I've argued with people like that. In the book, it's called Doublethink. In actual proper psychology, it's called, um, uh, oh God, um, Come on, guys. It's, this is a very well-known term. Cognitive dissonance, yes. It's called cognitive dissonance. The terror of 1984 is not the state. It's not surveillance. The terror of 1984 is how malleable human minds are and how effectively a healthy and rational mind can be polluted to serve whatever political needs are necessary. And in this respect... It is the far right in this country that is infinitely more Orwellian than even the, than the most severe nightmares they can conjure of Antifa or Pelosi or whatever boogeyman they're concerned about these days. If we're to talk about psychological brainwashing or doublethink, if we're to talk about the annulment of language or the introduction of terminology designed to obfuscate meaning rather than elucidate it, this is the right. The right. Earlier you said he didn't believe it was Antifa. He doesn't, and he does. 
I guarantee you it is both. It's very easy to live your life that way, by the way. A lot of people think this deliberate irrationality is some hyper-specific, far-off thing. No, anybody can believe this. Even, not even far-right people, even people who aren't far-right, even people who are moderates. Have you, I guarantee you that most of you, with your own parents, have found some incredible irrationality in their thought process that they are not willing to challenge. Right? Most of you probably, even not, it doesn't have to be some crazy far-right political thing. It could be something like innocuous or some superstition. It's very easy for people to fall into these traps because human minds are not built to be rational. That's like a, that's like a catch-all term. A lot of people say that, you know, humans aren't meant to be rational. It's true. Human minds are designed to quickly identify threats and engage in pattern recognition to maximize individual survival. Human brains were not evolved to deal with the complexities associated with a modern civilized society. They just weren't. Politics? Modern politics? Our brains aren't optimized for this. This is why we have so many cognitive biases. These are corruptions of tendencies that our brains have developed, which are meant to help us, but otherwise don't. Pattern recognition is supposed to be helpful to us. When the bush rustles, what noise does it make? One noise, that's probably a rabbit. Another noise, that's probably a tiger. That's useful. But what about pattern recognition when a police officer is deciding which groups of people he should police harder? That can get bad quickly. So we train ourselves. We train ourselves to be cognizant of these cognitive biases. We train ourselves to be better about managing them. We train ourselves to be more rational. You know, we have to think past the intuitive answer to everything. And this is why, you've probably seen this from a lot of other far-right conservative figures, they don't like introspection. They hate introspection. You notice that? There are a lot of people in the far-right who will actively say that introspection, the process of thinking about why you're doing this is unenviable. This is bad. You should, be, you should endorse the cult of action, not the cult of thinking. This is one of Umberto Eco's 14 points of fascism. The cult of action. Introspection is bad. It invites weakness. You turn into an egghead. You stop serving the state. You want to be strong. You want to do. You want to act. It all ties into each other. It all ties into itself. All of these cognitive biases, these mental weaknesses that are associated with fascism, that is what 1984 was describing. There's another component to 1984 and what it was trying to make a point about outside of just psychology, which was language, which I thought was really interesting. There's a section at the end of 1984, um, which is, um, I forget the technical term, but it's essentially a glossary of newspeak. Newspeak being um, the state language for o Oceania, the society they live in, in the story, um, which they're using to increasing extent. It's a mandated language, one they're creating, a deliberately forged language. And the goal of that language is to have as few words as possible. Yes, and it is the best part of the book. The rest of the book is great, but it is the best part of the book. Have you ever heard the term double plus ungood? Or double plus good, or plus good, or really any iteration of those basic terms. You might have heard somebody use it like uh, cynically. Like they'll say, like, for example, like a conservative will say, ah, Trump presence on Twitter, double plus ungood, must ban. Something like that. Somebody will like make fun of bureaucracy or make fun of totalitarianism by invoking that term. Well, newspeak, this isn't a spoiler, y'all can listen. Newspeak is actually a language. It's something that George Orwell created. It's usable, or at least sections of it are. Um, and the goal is to limit thought as much as possible. That's the goal. Because human thought is conveyed through language. When we think to ourselves, we think in words or ideas, but when we solidify those ideas, there are words. Words give control to thought. Without language, humans are much worse, not only at conveying difficult concepts, but actually thinking of them themselves. I can give you an example. How many of you learn new things about yourself because you heard a term describing gender or sexuality? I would be willing to bet for quite a few of you that a whole avenue of thought was opened, not even because you came into contact with like a new way of thinking, but because an idea attached to a word 
that you hadn't been aware of was now made aware of to you. Or maybe not gender and sexuality, but other stuff too. But it's weird, right? Like, how many of you are asexual? Did you even think that was a thing before you heard the term? I'd be willing to bet for a lot of you, no. The term itself carries meaning, but the meaning of the term solidifies thoughts you may have already had. People who before may have described themselves as, well, I don't really seem to care about sex as much as everyone else. I don't know. Maybe there's something wrong with me. I don't know. Now they have a term, asexuality. And because they have that term, so many thoughts can congregate around it. A term defines language in terms of engagement. Now you can describe things. A term allows you to relate your experiences to others. Maybe this is unrelatable to some of you, but I'm sure if you think there are probably some things in your life that you've learned like in this way. You've learned because you like learned this word. Language gives us the ability to convey thoughts. That's why sophisticated languages are important, you know? There are a lot of concepts we couldn't describe otherwise. Here's an example given in the book itself, okay? Get ready for it. Last thing I'll talk about. I know I'm rambling, but I like the book a lot, okay? Okay? Freedom. You knew it. D-Man Super, you knew it. Freedom. Free and freedom have a lot of meanings. They mean a lot of different things, okay? You could say, for example, that um, I am free of COVID-19, to my knowledge. Thank you. Um, or that uh, uh, this tin of Altoids mints, that was supposed to fall on the left hand. I was going to say is free of my right hand now, uh, which it is. Let me, let me get that. Yep. Free falling. Yes, it's free falling. Yes. Um, but when I talk about freedom on this channel, I'm usually talking about freedom in the abstract political sense. That is to say, freedom in the sense that you are free to live your life absent coercion or uh, uh, influence from other more powerful entities. You know, that's usually what I mean when I say freedom. And if you actually try to, like, distill the meaning of freedom, you'll find it's almost infinitely complex. Like, if you actually really think about it, if you were to like write out like all the ways freedom means a thing for as long as you could, like you could write like books to fill that up. It's incredibly complex. But imagine a society with more limited vocabulary where the term freedom only literally refers to an absence of one thing. So like I am free of COVID-19 or my hand is free of this or um, the cave is free of bears. You know, how would you describe to those people authoritarianism? How would you describe to those people what freedom meant? You could do it roundabout. You could find other words. You could say... Um, well, uh, there's, you know, you, you, you want to do without using the word freedom, because that only means like the literal freedom to them. Well, the society you live in right now restricts your behaviors. And in a different society, you could be, uh, you, you could live with less coercion. What if you took away the word coercion? What if you took away the word authority? You can do more things than you do. But even that's vague. Do more things. What does that mean? That doesn't, you're not really conveying the complexity of a free society. The point that I'm getting at, and if we really wanted to like fully explore this, it would take 20 minutes and we'd have to cross out so many words. But the point is, the more you work at this, you realize it's actually possible to limit people's thoughts by limiting the language they use. That appendix at the end of 1984, it talks about new speak and all the words that would be cut down. And the goal of the state in its implementation was to design a language which would insulate people from being able to even recognize or think about their own oppression. That it would be impossible for them to even conceive of it because their language would limit their thoughts in ways that made it impossible for them to conceive of abstract oppression. Free could only ever mean when you are rid of something. Authority could only ever mean your direct boss. 
and the or or get rid of those words entirely and just limit it to boss. Why keep authority? That's the term double plus ungood. There's a lot of meaning that you can derive from superfluous language. How many words do we have that mean the same thing as excellent? You know, excellent, spectacular, spl splendiferous, you know, uh, wonderful, brilliant, uh, yeah, amazing, yeah. There's, I mean, if we really look for them, there are probably a couple dozen, right? They all have subtly different meanings. You wouldn't use them interchangeably, but they basically mean the same thing. Those um, linguistic, um, those linguistic, um, the, the super, the superfluous linguistics, superfluous vocabulary is useful because it gives us a greater range of thought. Could you imagine poetry in a world where there is only one word to express any given idea, or, or frankly, just literature? Be ridiculous. It, it would just be a, a frank description of events every time. You, you would have, you, well, you would have very little to work with. You would be able to think of less, and thus you would be less capable of resisting, well, the agenda of people uh, who are looking to supplant your thoughts somewhat. Ah, oh, yeah, okay. In, in summary, in summary, there we go. There we go. That's 1984 for you. Look, it's just a book I like. I know nobody gives a fuck. I, I've talked about 1984 before, but... It, it, look. It, it's a good book, okay? I just don't like it when people use a, Orwellian as just, just this, like, random, fucking meaningless descriptor. Especially since, by the way, because Orwell was a socialist and he actually did believe that the simplification of language was a tool that could be used to repress people, he hated the word Orwellian because that word was a shorted, like, signifier that means more things. Because that word is itself a simplification of other things. You know the term Nazi? Nazi is itself a simplification of other terms. What was the full, well, I mean, National Socialist, but what was the German word for it? Um, they did the same, they did this all the time in Nazi Germany. Um, the, um, there are like tons of euphemisms, the NSDAP, um, not National Socialismus, thank you. Um, they did this in the Soviet Union as well. They would have um, like pullet bureau. They would have terms that would be deliberately crunched down in, because it abstracts meaning, you know, um, which can make it a little harder to fully understand, well, the meaning of the term. That's why, by the way, I don't like the term Antifa. I've said this before. It's catchy, so I use it too. Trust me, if Antifa had just called themselves anti-fascists and stuck with that, I think they would probably be doing a lot better in the public eye because it's way e because if nobody had ever heard the term Antifa, which sounds scary and militant, and it only ever had to say anti-fascist, it probably would have come across a lot better any time the news had to say anti-fascists clashed with the Proud Boys. That would be, I think, preferable. Um, but Antifa, what does Antifa mean? They say, well, fa means fascist, sure, but when people say Antifa, most people just hear Antifa. Not anti-fascist, shortened to Antifa. Language is important. R human rationality is important. We're all going to die. Read 1984. Done.